how we nowadays uh, treat this disease with uh, rather advanced uh, therapies, therapies that basically come from basic research and have found their way from the bench to the bedside, if you want. Uh, this is Paul Ehrlich. Uh, he died almost uh, a little bit more than 100 years ago. Uh, a German immunologist, and he was one of the first <coughs> who uh, made the observation that there are certain diseases that can't be explained by infections, bacteria, or other infections. Uh, it seems that the body turns towards its own elements, and he uh, coined this term of the so-called autotoxicus. Toxicus because he thought that toxins are responsible for these diseases. Horror because some of these diseases can be really life threatening. If you think, for example, um, in systemic lupus, uh, can be a very harmful disease. Uh, how are autoimmune diseases defined? Uh, these are the criteria by Rose and uh, Vitebsky. Uh, they usually post they postulated them in 1950. Seven and they were um, redesigned in 1993. And what you want to see if you talk about an autoimmune disease is that there is direct evidence from pathogenic autoantibodies or from pathogenic T cells. But as we will see, this is not always the case. And in uh, the ideal uh, world, we would also see an autoantigen that is re responsible for triggering uh, for the generation of autoreactive T cells. Then uh, we would like to see uh, animal models that reflect the disease. This is sometimes the case, but none of these animal models is 100% able to recapitulate uh, the clinical observations. These are usually rodent models, as you know. And uh, there should be uh, hints from clinical uh, observations that these diseases are not triggered by any other um, uh, causes, so there are no. So how often do we see these diseases? Approximately two to five percent of the population suffers from an autoimmune diseases. Uh, we nowadays uh, more like to talk about immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. Uh, these criteria that were postulated by Rose and Vitebsky do not hold true for all these diseases. Uh, usually, we have to deal with a breakdown of tolerance mechanisms, peripheral tolerance mechanisms. This can be on the side of the T cells or in the B cell, or it can also be a combination of both. Usually, these diseases are chronic, they are progressive and self perpetuating. There are currently still no real cure for these diseases. The best thing you can achieve uh, uh, by treating these patients is to keep these diseases under control. Females are usually might much more often affected by these diseases, and uh, usually these are diseases also of our Western civilized world. Uh, and we will talk about uh, why we think this has something to do with our um, hygiene standards, for example. The etiology is largely unknown. We think it's a combination of a genetic background, but these are not hereditary diseases by definition. Hormones play a role, as you can already uh, think about if you, uh, if we, we said lemons are more, much more frequently affected. Uh, some aberrations of the immune system play a role and also the environment. There's uh, the hypothesis that certain infections like viral infections can trigger uh, an autoimmune disease or lead to the outbreak of an autoimmune disease. Now, um, certain hypotheses are the accelerator overload hypothesis. Think about type 1 diabetes, uh, children that are uh, overweight. This would be a too much uh, or a chronic perpetuating stimuli for uh, the pancreatic gland, and this might lead to uh, the development of autoantibodies. The hygiene hypothesis um, always put forward that our hygiene standards are too high, our immune system uh, is not educated um, uh, well enough because uh, we're living in environments that doesn't uh, challenge our immune system um, frequently. The third and final hypothesis, if we think about antibiotics, antibiotics are frequently prescribed for uh, certain diseases. They always do some harm to our microbiome, to the composition of bacteria in our gut and our intestine. Therefore, old friends that 
would be bacteria that uh, usually uh, inoculate uh, our gastrointestinal tract can become um, from friends to foes, if you want so. And there's also a trash hypothesis is that we acquire certain stimuli, and if we uh, overgo this threshold, then this would lead to the outbreak of an autoimmune disease. Now, let's talk uh, just uh, briefly about the basic principles um, of what uh, do we think that triggers these diseases. This can be on the B cell side. Usually, then it's an autoantibody mediated disease. It can be on the T cell side or a combination of both. Uh, if we talk about autoantibodies, in principle, there are two uh, possibilities how autoantibodies can trigger an autoimmune disease. It could be an autoantibody which is directly pathogenic, and we will see an example for this. Uh, more frequently, it's uh, the phenomenon that uh, autoantibodies together with autoantigens form immune complexes. These immune complexes, like for example, in the case of vasculitis, are deposited in certain blood vessels and they are trigger an inflammatory disease. Uh, for this uh, second possibility, the immune complexes, uh, there is uh, Clemens Birquet. Uh, this is his monument in front of the Children's Hospital, right over there. Uh, and he was one of the first who uh, made this observation that immune complexes can trigger diseases. These were the so-called serum sickness or the diseases of the 14 states. What happened in uh, former days, uh, people were vaccinated against diphtheria uh, with immunoglobulins that were uh, harvested from horses. And these immunoglobulins, of course, uh, represented foreign immune uh, cells for our uh, immune system. Uh, our immune system started to produce uh, auto uh, antibodies against these uh, foreign uh, proteins and they formed immune complexes and this led to a disease that was characterized or is characterized by fever, arthritis, or swelling of the joints, or also a certain uh, skin manifestations. If we think about the T-cell side, also there are two possibilities. Uh, it could be a cytokine mediated <laughs> T-cell activation by an antigen presenting cell can lead to the production of uh, so-called pro-inflammatory cytokines, the most important ones, maybe interferon gamma, interleukin-17, nowadays very popular, and uh, TNF-alpha. The second one is that uh, T-cells, in this case this would be CD8-positive cytotoxic T-cells, are directly pathogenic and cause cell killing, tissue injury, uh, and inflammation. Uh, now, what diseases are, or do we think, are T-cell mediated? If we think about autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis uh, is always postulated uh, to be a T-cell triggered uh, autoimmune disease, although at the same time we also see the production of autoantibodies, like for example rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP antibodies. The specificity of the T-cells is directed against collagen, collagen type 2, or citrullinated peptides. Uh, multiple sclerosis would be another example. Here you have a specificity against the myelin basic protein. Type 1 diabetes, as already mentioned, inflammatory bowel diseases. <coughs> there you already see that the triggering autoantigens are not well known. For autoimmune myocarditis, their myosin would be uh, the triggering autoantigen for the production of reactive T cells. Now we will concentrate on rheumatoid arthritis um, and uh, discuss some of the aspects of this disease. Now the prevalence or uh, the frequency of the disease lies within the range of autoimmune diseases. 0.5 to 1% of the population suffers from chronic polyarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. This is the same um, disease, just uh, two different names. It's not only a disease that affects the joints, as we will see, it's a systemic autoimmune diseases. Uh, the etiology is partly known, partly unknown, and uh, the pathogenesis is incompletely understood. Now, uh, coming back to these uh, four uh, major triggering factors, there is a genetic background for uh, these uh, rheumatological diseases. In particular, we know this from twin studies. 
but the prevalence is not very high, even in monozygotic twins, for example, only about uh, 15 to 30 percent uh, there is a transfer of the disease. In particular, these are um, the genes that are associated with HLA class 2 molecules, so this already hints about antigen presentation, of course. Uh, we will hear about the shared epitope. This is a specific amino acid sequence in the HLA DRP1 uh, allele. And uh, we also know that endocrine factors, as I already said, women are more affected by this disease, and pregnancy can be, for example, uh, a rather dangerous period because the disease can first start during pregnancy or become worse during pregnancy, again, hinting that hormones uh, might play a role. Immune disorders um, are uh, a problem, and also the environment, again, infections, Epstein Barr virus infections. Uh, have been postulated to play a role in the pathogenesis. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, again, it's a combination of uh, a lot of factors probably, and not only one single factor, like for example, infection that would be uh, responsible for the outbreak. Now what happens in this disease, it's an inflammatory disease of our joint. So the left side would be a healthy joint with a synovial membrane. The synovial membrane is important to keep uh, our joints liquid and uh, for a smooth movement. And uh, in the case of RA, what happens is the uh, proliferation of the synovial tissue to, to the so-called synovitis or the inflammatory tissue. And uh, we see a migration of a variety of cells. Uh, we have a hypervascularization of this tissue. Uh, so we have cells of the innate immune system that are usually one of the first cells that invade to the synovial membrane, like for example monocytes, macrophages, uh, neutrophilic granulocytes, and also T cells, B cells, and the presenting cells, like for example dendritic cells, um, are part of this uh, cellular composition. And uh, as we will see later on, a uh, very important that is uh, osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are cells that differentiate from monocytic cells, and these cells ultimately are responsible for the destruction of bone tissue. Uh, and at the end of the day, this leads, this would be a healthy uh, x-ray or hand x-ray, to the destruction of this bony tissue, and everything that has been destroyed once cannot be repaired anymore. Now, the T cells um, are activated by an antigen presenting cell, uh, MHC plus 2 molecules, uh, together with the so called CPM2. Uh, we'll hear later on, and this leads to the activation of T cells. The antigen presenting cell standing behind this cell. And the most important ones, as you might know, are dendritic cells, of course. Now, as in the case of a lot of autoimmune diseases or auto inflammatory diseases, we don't even know this initiating or culprit autoantigen. There's a potential list of uh, autoantigens, IgG, citrullinated proteins, so these are usually part of the extracellular matrix, collagen, RS33, heat choke proteins. There's a long list, but they don't know if one of them would be responsible or it's a combination of autoantigens. And also if this combination changes in the course of the disease, which makes it a little bit difficult uh, to track this disease. Now, as you know, uh, T-cells uh, differentiate in this disease usually to TH1 T-cells, uh, stimulating back their um, differentiation via cytokines like interleukin-2, interferogamma. At the same time, we also have uh, an important role of uh, the newly defined uh, TH17 T-cells that are characterized by the production of interleukin-17 a very pleiotropic cytokine that has synergistic effects with other cytokines, chemo attractive uh, factors, <coughs> and also growth factors. So it's a mixture probably between TH1 and TH17. We have certain um, inflammatory diseases like, for example, psoriatic arthritis, that's even more on the side of TH17 T cells. Rheumatoid arthritis probably is a mixture of TH1 and TH17, but we don't know how much percent it plays a role uh, of each of these uh, two uh, T-cell subsets. Also, regulatory T-cells uh, play a role in the pathogenesis. There are, there are indications that 
uh, this important diesel subset that is in principle capable of controlling these other two effector T cell uh, subsets, that they are either diminished in numbers or also in their functional capacity to suppress other T cells. And we know that, for example, uh, TNF alpha, one of the uh, important uh, cytokines in this disease, as we will hear later on, uh, for example, down regulates FOXP3, an important transcription factor for regulatory T cells, or up regulates uh, the uh, type 2 uh, TNF receptor. certain therapies that target cytokines that stimulate the differentiation of the cells, like for example interleukin-12 or interleukin-23, or cytokines that are at the end of the day produced by this different <laughs> stimulate back on the B-cell themselves, and this together also contributes to this uh, synovial inflammatory response to the cartilage uh, degradation and uh, the bone destruction. Another not so fancy cell are fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are uh, residents in the joints. They are important already in the steady state in our joints because they are uh, play a role in the joint integrity, the cartilage production. Uh, they produce hyaluronic acid, for example, or nucleotin that keeps our joints smooth and uh, movable. But in the course of inflammation, they produce a variety of uh, growth factors or angiogenetic uh, factors. Um, this leads to the attraction of cells primarily of the innate immune system, so monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, also mast cells. At the same time, via the giant earth pathway, uh, fibroblasts also uh, are involved in the cartilage destruction because they produce this uh, matrix metalloproteinases that can uh, digest cartilage tissue. And they are even involved in uh, bone destruction because they express this uh, important ligand for rank uh, that is important for osteoclast differentiation and therefore also contribute to the destruction of bone tissue. I already told you that osteoclasts are the cells that are ultimately responsible for the destruction of the bone tissue. They are cells that differentiate from a monocytic precursor. certain uh, therapeutic compounds uh, take advantage of this interaction because they can uh, interfere here and block uh, this differentiation of a monocytic precursor cell. Uh, these monocytic precursor cells then differentiate to multinucleated osteoclasts and uh, finally to trap positive activated osteoclasts that are able to uh, digest bone tissue. Now, um, beside the cells, cytokines play an important role. We already heard that a lot of cells can produce these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and the cytokines themselves then have effects on uh, a number of cells. The most important ones are still interferon alpha, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1. They can also stimulate themselves, so interleukin-1 stimulates the production of uh, TNF-alpha and uh, vice versa. Uh, the most pleiotropic cytokine is probably interleukin-6 because it has not only effects inside the joint on osteoclast, fibroblast, T-cells, but also outside the joint, even on hematopoietic stem cells for the differentiation. 
And if we put all these um, parts of uh, pathogenetic uh, mechanisms together, we can, if we want, draw this kind of picture. Down here would be, so this would be the synovial tissue. This would be the cartilage. This is the bone tissue. This is a blood vessel. And out from these blood vessels uh, come uh, the cells of the innate immune system, neutrophils, granulocytes. Then we have this important activation of T cells, fine antigen presenting cells, the differentiation of P cells to a Th1, Th17 T cells lineage. Uh, T cells give help to B cells. B cells here uh, differentiate to plasma cells. Plasma cells produce immune complexes, autoantibodies like rheumatoid factor, for example. The cytokines stimulate the differentiation of monocytes macrophages. Here are these TNF alpha, interleukin 1, interleukin 6. Uh, that leads to the differentiation of monocytes to osteoclasts uh, and uh, ultimately to this bone and cartilage destruction. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about NK cells? Um, NK cells are not part of this uh, pathogenetic uh, no, no, no. hypothesis. Not in rheumatoid arthritis so far. No, no. We have certain um, uh, theories that if we interfere with NK cells, that this can then lead to um, side effects of certain therapies, but uh, they have not been in the focus as driving cells of the disease so far. Um, one phenomenon of uh, the disease is that uh, we have probably to distinguish between two phases. So we have one phase where antigen presentation takes place, uh, probably at the beginning, not even inside the joint, but in the bony lymph nodes and secondary lymphoid organs, uh, where potential autoantigens might trigger the differentiation. Then the disease transfers from the secondary lymphoid organs to the joint, where you can also have antigen presentation. Uh, all the cells would be there. And then it translates from an antigen-driven to a mainly cytokine-driven uh, part of the disease. And this is probably also the explanation why uh, therapies that either target antigen presentation or T-cell activation work in this disease, but also very uh, effectively the cytokine blockade, as we would see later on. Now, how do you know that a certain inflammatory disease is a rheumatoid arthritis? I also already mentioned the psoriatic arthritis is another one. Uh, it's not uh, always crystal clear, like in this picture. Um, this would be a very long, chronic um, phase of the disease. Uh, we have a typical swelling of the metacarpophalangeal joints and the proximal interphalangeal joints. Uh, this also hurts, as you might imagine. The patients are not able to make a fist in the morning when they wake up. Uh, we have this called ulna deviation, so deviation of our fingers to the ulna side. We have a muscle atrophy here. Uh, and maybe even rheumatoid nodules, uh, like here, for example. Now, this is very clear, but at the beginning, the disease rather looks like this, so uh, a rather distinct swelling. But the typical swelling of this proximal interphalangeal joint that's characteristic for rheumatoid arthritis and not of this distal interphalangeal joint. And why this is the case, nobody knows so far. Now, um, there are certain laboratory tests one can perform in addition to this clinical picture, of course. But uh, the golden rule says that there is no laboratory test <laughs> disease, and this also holds true for rheumatoid arthritis. So it's always a combination of the history, how the whole thing presents. We talk about the chronic disease. So before three months of disease duration, it's not even chronic about the clinical picture. But it's important, there are certain laboratory tests, uh, as we will see later on. The imaging is important, but this imaging only becomes positive after a year or two of a standing uh, disease, and then the disease course, if this is a one-time event or if this is a long-standing event. Um, one of the laboratory parameters, a very old one, is rheumatoid factor. Uh, actually detected in the 1940s by Wagner and Rose. It was the first autoantibody um, we were able to um, determine. 
It's a very unspecific on the antibody. It's unspecifically directed against the IFC part of uh, IgG. Usually it's an IgM antibody, uh, but we can also observe IgG or IgA antibodies. Not all of the patients have this rheumatoid factor, so only roughly two thirds of the patients. And it's also not specific for rheumatoid arthritis. So we have infections, we have malignant diseases, uh, up to 15% of the healthy population has a rheumatoid factor, uh, but not the disease. And this often leads to confusion, as you can imagine, because this is a kind of standard test that it's frequently done outside, and which of course uh, then scares a lot of people if they have a positive rheumatoid factor. Um, a little bit uh, less or less um, uh, um, uh, uh, newer development are autoantibodies against citrullinated cyclic peptides that can be detected in these patients. Um, they are similar as rheumatoid factor important for the diagnosis, but also again similar as rheumatoid factors also important for the prognosis. So if you have a patient who has both rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibodies, these are patients who are in danger of joint destruction and a very aggressive disease. Which uh, leads to the question if autoantibodies are directly pathogenic. Uh, we know this for uh, certain antibodies, like for example, entry uh, in Geostelia gravis, the anti antibiotic receptor antibodies or in grave disease or autoimmune arthritis. They are possibly pathogenic autoantibodies like rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibodies, but no direct evidence. There are also <coughs> antibodies that are detected in inflammatory vessel diseases, the so-called ANCA, and the neutrophil cytoplasmatic antibodies might play a role, and anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies are suspected to play a role in uh, systemic lupus. But only for this one, uh, the direct pathogenic mechanism has been proven. Uh, and the majority of uh, systemic autoantibodies that can be detected, if you test for uh, a variety of them, probably don't play any pathogenic role, but are kind of side effect of our immune system. If the whole immune system um, becomes activated, then uh, you also detect a lot of autoantibodies that don't necessarily are involved in the pathogenesis. Now the radiologic findings uh, are very characteristic in this disease. So uh, as we hear, osteoclasts are responsible for the destruction of the spawn tissue. This can uh, rather be discreet at the beginning of the disease, but then if you don't treat this patient uh, enough, then this leads to a massive destruction of joints with pain and a loss of uh, functionality, of course. That's a, a very dangerous manifestation of the disease is the dense axis of our uh, cervical spine is affected because this then can lead to an instability uh, of your first uh, cervical joint uh, with a compression of the myelon uh, and this is uh, even uh, life threatening. Uh, I already mentioned that this is a systemic disease so it's not only uh, inside the joints but, for example, rheumatoid nodules can be observed uh, close to joints, but also in internal organs, like, for example, in the lung, where you can have these lumps here. Um, and um, you can imagine that this is, has a, quite a long list of uh, differential diagnoses. This, of course, could also be some kind of a malignant disease, and this has to be uh, proven that this is really a rheumatoid nodule. Uh, well, if we know that this is now rheumatoid arthritis, uh, how do we treat these conditions? And uh, always keep in mind that the aim of this treatment should be to prevent... <laughs> Nowadays, we still are not able to heal any kind of uh, bone destruction. Uh, and there are, as we will hear, a variety of different uh, therapeutic strategies. Uh, so this would be the basis, adversarity, physical therapy, uh, the history and the exam. Then we have this large group of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And then there is an important line 
uh, because if you have the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, what you have to treat the patient with is a so-called disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug, so-called DMARC. Uh, that's very important because only for this group up here, uh, it has been really demonstrated that these, um, uh, that these um, drugs are able to prevent this bone destruction. You can uh, treat someone with uh, NSAIDs. This will help you against the inflammation and against the pain. But these drugs down here, and also not glucocorticoids, are able to stop this uh, destructive process of the bone tissue. Uh, up here, if we, so it would be um, uh, kind of a prerequisite to treat the patient as soon as they have the diagnosis, as soon as possible with a so-called DMR. Uh, as we will see, there are um, a lot of older drugs, like for example, methotrexate, methunamide, salatoprid, and then all this uh, long, long list of uh, biological therapies, targeted therapies uh, that we will briefly discuss. So in former days, we only had one type of DMART. Nowadays, we talk about conventional synthetic DMARTs, so this would be methotrexate, for example, methunamide. Uh, we have a group now of targeted synthetic DMARTs. These are kinase inhibitors that interfere with uh, intracellular signaling pathways. We have the large group of biologicals, biological DMARTs, monoclonal antibodies or receptor constructs. And uh, since about two years, we also have uh, so-called biosimilars, a kind of uh, generic uh, follow-up drugs from biologicals. Um, I already showed you here that glucocorticoids always go in parallel uh, with all these other treatments because glucocorticoids are very effective uh, in um, treating um, this acute onset of the diseases. Um, they act via multiple pathways, NF-CoV-B, AP1 uh, signaling pathways. They act very rapidly, that's why we like them so much. Uh, and they are very potent anti-inflammatory drugs. You can treat them for patients with low doses, up to very high doses, uh, orally or IV. Uh, and the problem with glucocorticoids, as you might know, are all the side effects in particular if you want to treat patients for a longer time period. So they have uh, um, very deleterious uh, effects on uh, bone tissue, osteoporosis, osteonecrosis, the Cushing syndrome, it's not good for the eyes and also not for the skin, and a lot of uh, infections, opportunistic infections, uh, can occur if you treat the patients <coughs> for a long time with these drugs. So it's a very effective drug for a short time treatment period, but not uh, for the long run, and keep in mind that these are chronic uh, patients, so we have to treat them for um, more or less um, the rest of their life. This is the big group, uh, group of uh, insights, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and um, these actually represent a group or a very long list. Some of them you might know for headache, like for example, naproxen or ibuprofen, bufen, pakimed, felden, a very old one, voltaren, one of the most uh, frequently used ones. Uh, they belong to different um, uh, synthetic or biochemical entities and down here uh, are the latest uh, inventions, the so-called selective <coughs> COX-2 inhibitors. Some of them have been removed from the market because of side effects and um, they all act via the Aradon uh, acid cascade uh, up here. Uh, the cyclooxygenase is blocked by these uh, monster anti-inflammatory drugs and therefore uh, things like leukotriene or prostaglandins uh, aren't produced anymore. The problem is that these drugs also have a lot of side effects. On uh, the kidney, on the gastrointestinal drug, leading to gastritis, ulcerations, bleedings, they are not good for your blood system, for the liver, for the skin. They have a very uh, problematic cardiovascular risk profile uh, and also the brain uh, is affected by these drugs. Um, these drugs can be distinguished uh, between 100% um, selective COX-2 inhibitors or drugs that are more to the side of the COX-1. Um, COX-2 is the um, effect.
project, so for the production of prostaglandins. COX-1, on the other hand, is uh, important for physiolog uh, physiological um, functions, like, for example, for uh, the regulation of our platelets or for blood correlation. And some of the uh, drugs are more to this side and some are more um, to this side. Then we have this uh, group of um, DMARTs, uh, the conventional synthetic DMARTs. These are in principle all drugs that somehow interfere with uh, cell cycle, so uh, with the synthesis phase of cell cycle. The older ones are um, cyclosporine, we don't use this anymore in rheumatology. Uh, Methotrexate is still the classical one. Uh, is a thioprene and cyclophosphamide is a very, or the most potent immunosuppressive drug uh, that's not used for rheumatoid arthritis but only for patients like, for example, systemic lupus and vascular patients. So, um, if we talk about the steamat, the first <coughs> choice nowadays is still metotrexate. The second choice for these patients would be the flunomide, for example, or sulfasalazine or hydroxychloroquine. And then we also have this uh, reserved um, synthetic DMARC. Uh, unfortunately, also these um, conventional synthetic DMARCs have side effects, gastrointestinal side effects, hematological side effects leading to leukopenias, uh, so a diminishing or drop in uh, leukocyte counts. On the one hand, that's something you want to see with these drugs because some of your inflammatory cells are reduced. On the other um, side, of course, this can also uh, lead you to certain troubles. Uh, so I already showed you this slide. We now have not only these conventional synthetic thing marks, but now also the targeted, the biologicals, <coughs> the biosimilars. And uh, these biologics are also called uh, targeted therapies because they more specifically interfere in this pathogenetic concept uh, of rheumatoid arthritis. So we have um, drugs that target cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines down here. Uh, the most important one are TNF blockers, blockers against interleukin-1 or interleukin-6. <coughs> Uh, the largest group are the TNF blockers, so we have five originators and meanwhile already three biosimilars. Then we have uh, drugs that target T cells, so they would interfere here with the activation of T cells. The drug we're talking about is Abatacept. And uh, we also have a drug against B cells that was not invented in rheumatology but comes from the hematological field where it was used or where it's used for a long time for B cell lymphomas. Uh, so we would interfere here, uh, depleting B cells uh, and therefore anti body production and presentation. So these are these uh, different biologicals uh, again. So this is uh, nowadays, so 2016. As I said, the largest group are these um, DNF blockers. Down here we also have drugs that um, target uh, pro or differentiation cytokines, if you remember this uh, T cell slide, interleukin 12, 23 is important for TH1, TH17 T cell differentiation. These uh, drugs are not used in rheumatoid arthritis, but more in psoriatic arthritis, where interleukin 17 is more important. We have drugs that directly uh, block interleukin 17, secokinumab, for example, also licensed in psoriatic arthritis uh, or psoriasis. Then the T-cell drug, the B-cell drug, we have two B-cell drugs, not only rituximab, uh, against, um, that's used in rheumatoid arthritis and also in SLE. Uh, but the second one, Belimumab, that's uh, directed against the B-cell growth factor, BLIS or BAF, and that's licensed in systemic lupus. Oops, sorry. Um, this would be a biological drug, a monoclonal antibody, this would be aspirin. So these are very complex structures, um, proteins, large compounds, very complex. Um, from aspirin, you can make a generic drug, a completely identical, completely identical drug for monoclonal antibody. You can make a generic drug. That's also the reason why uh, the follow-up drugs are called biosimilars, because they're similar but not uh, identical.
the manufacturing process of this uh, biologic is, is very complex. You need a DNA vector, the cloning, you have to express this in, in, a, in, a, in a certain cell line. This has to be stably uh, expressed. Uh, you have to uh, switch to a large scale fermentation, then you have to downstream the whole thing, and you have to find a formulation where you can then apply this drug to a patient. Usually nowadays this is done some So this would bind to the receptor uh, here. Uh, or uh, we have also compounds that target um, the soluble uh, cytokine as well as the membrane bound cytokine. <coughs> these are these. Hmm. Do, you, do you see this slide? On the back? No. Sorry, it's not very good. Sorry. These are these five uh, initial TNF blocking uh, agents. So this was the first one in Fliximab. Uh, the red stuff is still mouse. So we have a chimeric antibody, partially mouse, partially human. Um, Etanacept was the second one. This is a, is a receptor construct. So it blocks soluble and membrane bound TNF alpha. Uh, and the next developments were completely humanized antibodies, like for example, adalimumab or rolimumab. Uh, and then we also have this uh, compound here, that's terzutizumab. Uh, this also has uh, some mouse parts, and then it has this pegylated glycol part, uh, because this is only the FAB fragment and not the whole antibody anymore. Uh, depending on their half lifetime, they have to be administered uh, uh, every second week, uh, once a month, or uh, once a week, for example. Um, they can be administered uh, IV, or we also have formulation for subcutaneously, which is of course more convenient uh, for the patients nowadays. And if you wonder why these uh, constructs have these uh, funky names, uh, the Ximab tells you it's a chimeric antibody, so in Fliximab uh, already tells you that there is still a mouse part and a human part in there. The Zumab is a humanized antibody, it's not fully human, but it's almost human. So the Zumab uh, tells you that there are still some mouse parts in there. And Mumab would mean that it's a fully human um, uh, antibody. And this has, of course, something to do, at least we think it has something to do with the immunogenicity or the antigenicity of a certain construct. Of course, if you have an antibody that has mouse parts in there, it's more foreign uh, to our immune system as a fully uh, human or a humanized antibody. Uh, and these are the two uh, biosimilars I already told you. So we have two um, biosimilars for infliximab and one now for anacetylase. And what do we want to see from these uh, new uh, drugs? Uh, this you will see it now a couple of times, so-called ACR20, ACR50, ACR70. ACR stands for American College of Rheumatology. And that's the degree of improvement we can see in our patients. So ACR20 would mean uh, that the patient improves 20% in his clinical uh, disease activity. Usually that's a combination of the number of the swollen joints, the tender joints, of how the patient thinks he feels, of how the patient thinks his disease activity is, and how the, how the, how the doctor thinks that his disease activity is. And uh, what we can achieve with these drugs is this. About 60% achieve a 20% improvement, 40% achieve a 50% improvement, and only 20% achieve a 70% improvement. So even with this uh, very um, fancy and also very expensive drugs, we don't achieve an ACR 100. ACR 100 would be a health solution. Uh, you see this in the field of uh, dermatology. There you have certain scores where you really have a 100% improvement. Uh, in rheumatology, this doesn't exist so far. Uh, and only 20% have a 70% improvement. 
So a substantial improvement is actually an ACR50 response, so half better if you want so. Uh, but uh, usually we always look at this ACR20 response rates because they look even, in most of the cases, much more impressive. Um, so not all these drugs are no uh, wonder drugs and they also have uh, a couple of side effects and the most important one are infections. Uh, in particular, tuberculosis, this was uh, one disease that came up when the first DNF blockers were tested. Um, we have a reactivation of a latent TB infection, so if your immune system uh, once was uh, challenged or if it once was um, um, a challenge with a TB disease, usually your immune system is capable of controlling this disease. But what anti-TNF does is uh, that it dissolves these uh, tubercle granulomas, where uh, usually the tubercle bacilli with a latent TB with a TNF blocking agent, then the granulomas dissolves and the disease um, reactivates. Uh, there were also cases of a very uh, nasty, atypical TB diseases, and um, these patients are also uh, under a higher risk of developing TB if they are treated with these uh, drugs. This is important nowadays, think about the globalization, if someone travels to India uh, three times a year, this can be a problem if he's treated with uh, TNF blocker. Uh, and we also have other uh, bacteria that usually um, are very, very rare, but can be observed under this immunosuppressive cell. Uh, the second concept, apart from uh, interfering with the disease downstream, so by blocking the triggering cytokines, uh, was to interfere with the activation of T cells, uh, rather upstream from the, this pathogenetic concept. Uh, and as you know, T cells uh, need two signals, signal 1, signal 2 for a full activation, signal 1 being delivered by the MC class 2 molecules uh, via the T cell receptor, and signal 2 with this, this important interaction uh, between co-stimulatory molecules, CD8, CD86 on an, on an antigen presenting cell, and CD28 on a T cell. Um, and one compound that inhibits this interaction of CD28 with CD8 and CD86 on an antigen presenting cell is a buffer set. Uh, that's a fusion protein of CTLA4 linked to an FC part of IgG and has a very high affinity for these B7 uh, or B71, B72 molecules. Therefore, CD28 cannot bind anymore and therefore T cell proliferation is blocked. Make sense? Yes. And as you now see, these are data from this initial uh, lysosome study. This works as nicely as the TNF blocking agent. So, also this ACR70 rates, you are up here in 60 70% of the patients reach these ACR20 uh, rates. Um, this is not something from uh, rheumatology, this is a completely uh, different trial, but I only bring it here because uh, it highlights how, uh, how substantial it is to interfere with this um, activating confirmatory molecules. This was an antibody called TGM1412, tested 2006. Uh, the idea behind this antibody was to increase the number of regulatory T cells, uh, but what unfortunately happened, uh, because this is a super agonistic antibody, it directly activated uh, all T cells uh, in the organism. It was tested in six healthy volunteers, so this was a phase one study, and led to this uh, cytokine storm syndrome. So they became uh, terribly ill, developed pneumonitis, renal failure, uh, coagulation problems. Two of these patients ended up at the intensive care unit with a cardiovascular shock and um, uh, tremendous lung problems. And um, this led to a big discussion how could such a, a compound cause these uh, um, unfortunate results? Because the predicted mechanism uh, was the expansion of regulatory T cells and not the activation of effector memory T cells, of course. Uh, nobody would want to see that. And 
in the preclinical um, analysis, they made a lot of um, experiments actually to prove this concept and to exclude the possibility uh, of, the of the activation of effector memory T cells because what they did in the mouse, they did primate studies, so in monkeys, and also with human PBMCs. But as you can see from this um, hypothesis, this is very recent, there are always problems with this security uh, barriers, if you want so, because in the mouse, um, inbred mice uh, uh, here in our laboratories, they only have very, very low numbers of effector memory T cells. These T cells you would only see in a really wild type mouse outside in the nature, but not uh, under these inbred strains. And uh, this was the reason that they didn't observe any uh, safety signals uh, in uh, the mouse you know, or in the mice tested with this uh, um, compound. The second problem that they even went to monkeys, uh, but uh, CD4 T cells down regulate the CD28 molecules as soon as they differentiate in monkeys to affect the memory T cells and therefore they couldn't detect any effect. Uh, they also tested it with human PBMCs, but uh, in vitro, and not in vivo of course. In vivo was done this phase one trial. And uh, the reason here, probably, that they didn't get any activation of T cells is that uh, in a petri dish, uh, the density of the T cells is rather low. And only under the density of tissue um, uh, conditions, uh, the T cells. And all this uh, went wrong, and then they went to uh, do this first human trial uh, with the reported results. So this is not in rheumatology, but uh, it should illustrate how <coughs> how uh, tricky it is to uh, interfere with this uh, T-cell activation. Now, the next target, the next cellular target uh, that was addressed, again based on this uh, um, pathophysiological hypothesis, are B-cells, uh, because they are antigen-presenting cells, produce cytokines and produce antibodies. And the compound uh, used, uh, or we still use, is CD20, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. Rituximab, you know, now know that this is still a chimeric antibody, part mouse, part human. And uh, rituximab depletes B cells from a pre-B cell stage up to the memory B cell stage. Uh, very effectively and uh, for a long time. So you only have to treat a patient uh, one, uh, twice per year uh, with an infusion of anti-CD20 antibodies to deplete uh, all these uh, stages of his B-cell differentiation. Uh, this is the last or the latest uh, development uh, we now have to deal with in rheumatology, the so-called small molecule compounds. These are also DMARs. These are now these targeted synthetic DMARs. Uh, so they are, as the name already tells you, they are small. They are not as big as monoclonal antibodies. Uh, they are smaller than 1 kD, not 200, 250 kD, uh, the size of a monoclonal antibody. Um, the nice thing about these compounds might be that you don't have to administer them subcutaneously or IV. You can also swallow them, so they can be given orally. Um, the idea or the hope is that they would be less expensive as uh, biologicals, which might not 100% turn out to be true. And of course, they have to prove that they are at least uh, uh, the same effective and safe as uh, biological drugs. So. Um, if we think about signaling cascades, we have uh, so far three, um, <coughs> three points of interference. We have check inhibitors, P38, MAP kinase inhibitors, and SIC inhibitors. Um, this all, at the end of the day, interferes with the transcription uh, factors and the transcription of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, this is a very, very long list of small molecule compounds, the largest group uh, these P38 MAP kinase inhibitors, they already are gone. Um, companies uh, spend a lot of money in these P38 inhibitors. They all turned out either to be not effective or to be associated with two uh, tremendous side effects, in particular infections, uh, and all the programs have been stopped with these P38 inhibitors. Also, uh, Fostamatinib, a sick inhibitor, uh, was um, stopped all the development because of side effects. And uh, what's left behind are these check inhibitors. 
Now, this Jack inhibitors, the Janus kinase, um, these are uh, kinases um, that are triggered by a uh, certain uh, large group of cytokines. We have to distinguish between uh, Jack 1, Jack 2, Jack 3. Some of them have overlapping triggering cytokines. We also have type 2. And as you can see, we here have cytokines that have to do something with inflammation, like for example, the uh, interferons, interferon alpha, interferon beta, interferon gamma, interleukin 6, we already heard this one, uh, but, or, or interleukin 12 and 23. But the problem might be that there are also cytokines that are important for our immune system, like for example, interleukin 10, a regulatory cytokine, interleukin 4 for Th2 differentiation. Um, Janus kinases is already also respond to things like uh, hormones or growth factors, erythropoietin, GMCSF, and uh, this might explain some of the side effects or uh, side effects we have to be aware uh, if we treat this patient. Uh, one important question is also if we have all these many biological therapies, targeted synthetic uh, therapies, what's actually the best one? Um, what to treat the patient? And uh, we don't have a lot of head-to-head -head studies, unfortunately. So we only have this ample study so far, uh, where you had the direct comparison of a apatex. So this would be the T-cell uh, blocking agent with a TNF blocking agent. And uh, what turned out was very surprising that these completely different concepts, uh, even if you compare them head to head, they were equally effective. So here you again have these ACR20 rates. So this was not uh, a different ACR50 rates and also ACR7. <laughs> which led to the question how can it be that you interfere at two very different uh, points in the pathogenesis, either with a TNF blockade or uh, via T cell inhibition, and this gives you the same practically clinical outcome. Now, one reason might be uh, the binding to these uh, co cellular molecules on the antigen presenting cell. Of course, this blocks, as we already heard, the activation of a T cell. But at the same time, it could also, there was the theory that leads to a, um, to a backward signaling inside the antigen presenting cell. And um, this was actually true. This is from our own laboratory, from uh, Michael Bonelli. When he analyzed the monocytes from patients who were treated with uh, a <coughs> uh, after two or four weeks, what he observed is that these monocytes uh, kind of lost their migratory capacity in vitro. And uh, this, uh, uh, he was also re able to recapitulate if you treat monocytes from healthy individuals with CTLA-4 overnight, uh, those dependently you also prevent the migratory capacity of these monocytes. Uh, so this led to this concept that the monocytes then are not able uh, to migrate to the joints anymore and synovial biopsies in fact have proven this contract. So uh, this led to this increase of monocytes in the periphery because they can't migrate to the inflammatory tissue anymore. Uh, they also have a reduced expression of the tissue molecules, uh, which fits to that. They have a reduced transendothelial migration, and uh, this might explain a reduced migration to this inflammatory tissue. So, uh, yeah, these are the, the numbers I already said, told you. Uh, and uh, we already said that we only achieved this ACL70 response, so almost complete healing in only 20% of the patients. And this has le now leads to this tremendous need for biomarkers. So it would be fantastic if we would have biomarkers that would either predict uh, who is really in danger of developing this kind of disease, so the very destructive disease. If you want, we have these biomarkers, kind of, like rheumatoid factor or FSCCP antibody, but of course it would be fantastic to have more of them. And the second one is also well, to have a biomarker that would predict uh, what kind of patients respond to what kind of therapy. Uh, this would not be very important for the patient, of course, because uh, nowadays you might go uh, through 
five, six courses of different uh, compounds, but also for our health system, because this costs a lot of money, of course, and it would be interesting to already know right at the beginning which patient would profit the most from a specific therapy. So this I have uh, adapted from a, a famous Scandinavian rheumatologist. This is kind of, it's already I think my last slide, uh, the kind of how we treat the disease nowadays. So we start here in the course of the disease. This would be time, this would be information. So only if we have clinical signs of the disease, uh, then we would start to treat the patient with uh, a certain therapy. If we don't anything, uh, this would lead to this chronic destruction, to destruction of the bone tissue and the joints. So the therapy we nowadays have is uh, to prevent this, um, this uh, destruction and uh, keep this patient under chronic treatment. But we are still far away from reducing uh, this, um, this uh, course of the disease to a complete repair. Uh, what we would need is therefore to have therapies where we already would start at the development of unspecific symptoms or even at the triggering of this autoimmune process when the patient doesn't have any kind of clinical signs of the disease interfere here with the triggering uh, of uh, our immune system and maybe this would then allow to really cure this kind of autoimmune diseases. But this is of course something very um, delicate, I would say, to treat someone who hasn't developed kind of the disease uh, kind of uh, prospectively uh, for the future. Because then we would interfere maybe here really with the, with the uh, autoimmunological processes and not be with this uh, cytokine driven disease uh, anymore. Uh, yeah, this would be the kind of customized therapy, the right drug, for the right patient, for the right time. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, these are people who um, who worked on this uh, on this thesis, in particular Mr. Romelli uh, and Lisa Göschel. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.